Hello there beautiful teachers and welcome to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. It is so good to be back with you again. This is your weekly show where we give you the latest news, fun resources that have come out in our industry. We have a special topic each week we dive into and this week it's all about motivation mistakes that teachers make. Mm, how intriguing. What mistakes do you think you're making with motivation? Well, we're about to find out. We also do a weekly website review or two web reviews of teachers' sites so that we can learn about marketing and branding ourselves online and all of that good stuff through watching other sites. And we have some sneak peeks at fun stuff coming up. And then lastly, our Ask Me Anything section where I answer anything and everything you can throw at me in the last few minutes of the show. So if you're new here, please do let us know in the chat. Ask us how to make the most of this chat, get in touch with the community, and mostly just chime in because we are the friendliest bunch on the internets. That is a guarantee. No, I can't guarantee that, but we are super friendly. So come say hi to us in the chat. We love to hear from you. And I see many, many returning faces here as well. It's great to be back with you all again. So let's dive into the latest news because there's a lot going on. Okay, I'll start with me. My personal update. What have I been doing? Well, this week has felt pretty manic, to be honest with you. It's felt pretty, pretty busy. So I've been... It's my first week back at teaching. Woohoo! Everyone join in if you were on an Easter break before and you've been back as well. It was actually really good to be back. You know that feeling you get before you go back to teaching and you're like, oh, really? You know, after a break, you're like, I mean, I want to see them and I know I enjoy this, but there's a little bit of you that has what we would call in Ireland the fear, right? That feeling on Sunday night when you know you have to go back to work. So there's a bit of that after teaching break, I think. And I certainly had some of that. And then I started teaching and I was like, oh yeah, this is great. And it's been so fun. And I've been chatting with my students about their composing projects and going through that. So that's really fun. And also about the concert. So we were setting their concert pieces. It's coming up on May 22nd for us. We're doing another video concert, online YouTube live concert. And so students are going to be submitting videos as they've done before. They're all very familiar with this now. Um, so it's all about keeping it fresh, right? And I've decided to do something very simple. So this doesn't even warrant a separate chat topic, I don't think, or anything like that. If you have any questions about it, let me know. But here's my idea, and you're welcome to steal it. What we're doing is just literally, they take their piece, the composer or the title or something else they know about their piece, and they somehow represent that in their video. That's it. And it's fun and it's simple. Our spring recital is always simple. It's always just, I call it the spring celebration. It's supposed to be just a celebration of what you learned this year. You pick your favorite piece. We have fun. It's very, um, yeah, simple in format. And so I'll give you a couple examples. Like one student is doing a wistful daydream from Piano Safari. So she's going to wear pajamas. She's going to have blankets on the piano in her video. We're still in... Um, pretty much locked down here in Ireland. So they're not here recording their videos at home. And another student, like if there's nothing in the piece title, we might refer to the composer. So like she's doing something by Jennifer Eklund. And I told her about Jennifer's border collies because she has rescue dogs and they're border collies. And we thought, okay, well, we could do like, even if we don't have a border collie toy, we can do like a black and white theme, right? So it can be any interpretation like that. And we're having fun discussing it. Uh, they'll be recording the videos in a few weeks. So I'm excited to see how they all turn out. And yeah, should be fun, should be fun. And it's been fun getting back into teaching, but yeah, lots of other stuff going on. So recording podcast stuff, lots of writing. It felt like a really writing heavy week. Um, also big batch of games going on right now. So lots going on. But in personal land, Sunday, yesterday, that's yesterday, was my first 
time since before Christmas, I think, or maybe just around New Year's, uh, going up to the, to, to the Dublin mountains. So if you're not familiar with the landscape of Dublin, if you don't live here, why would you be? But we're basically in a in a bow in Dublin. We're on the sea, but we're in sort of a bow. We've got mountains kind of around us. And my default Sunday walk is to go up the Dublin mountains and walk in the pine trees or in one of the woods up there. And I love it. And we've had to walk around parks for the past while and a lot of trendy trendy. So I was just really thankful to get up there with different views and look down over the city. I, somehow that makes a big difference for me. So that was wonderful. Um, and then we have new releases for you, of course. So we had today the five mass of music student motivation great complimentary podcast episode and article for this one right here and then we had a review of my music staff which it seems like you guys are really enjoying seeing my overview of it so it's just my impressions of how i use it some of the features the other features that i don't use but i think are great and also some advice on who it's not for in case you're considering like, is this right for me? Should I get it? Is it worth it? That kind of thing. So hopefully that's useful for you all. It's updated. I did it literally recorded like two weeks ago or something. So it's as it looks right now and uh, the features that are in that app or that site right now. Some other things from around the web. Before I get to our biggest news of the last week, which members might know what I'm talking about, but some other stuff from around the web. So we've got um, a great post I wanted to mention to you guys was on Top Music. So on the Top Music blog, they had an updated version of the top 10 pop songs. Uh, so they're just 10 classic pop songs that most students will know. And I think it's a great list, it's a great go-to, especially if you have new adult students, new teens, and you want to look up some songs that you could teach them by road or if they're reading by reading and give them some quick wins early on. So that's a great one, that's on the Top Music blog. And then the other thing I want to mention is nothing really to do with music, only peripheral, peripherally? Is that a word? Is there a word that means that? Anyway. Um, peripherally yeah it was on the planet money podcast who likes that podcast does anyone listen mm -hmm. so planet money had work in nine to five on their podcast and it was about it was the story really of uh, the writing of the film and so it's vaguely related to us because obviously Dolly Parton song it's very famous and stuff and Dolly Parton's amazing and I knew a lot of the backstory but I didn't know about this particular woman's role and, and that and I think it's a really interesting story in general about how music can bring a social movement to life and just the wonder that is Dolly Parton and all of that stuff so really interesting that was Planet Money it's an NPR one big one and then lastly we released the student sleuth who's seen it who's used it are you enjoying it? The Student Sleuth is a new feature inside Vibrant Music Teaching and I'm going to show you what it looks like because it makes more sense to see it in action. So here it is. Okay, so this is the member dashboard. If you're not a member and you haven't seen this before, welcome. This is what it looks like when members are logged in. If they've already filled in the teacher tracker, this is. Otherwise, it looks a bit different. But right down here, we have now the Student Sleuth. And if I click on this, we'll go over to the quiz. I'm not going to do the full thing here. I'm just going to give you a little flavor because there are separate videos on this. But what it is, simple form to start out. And um, we put in a name, Alfred, why not? And Alfred is nine and he's been studying two years. OK, and if I put that in, it's going to take me to a quiz based on Alfred's age and stage, right? So it shows what it is at the top. That number is just based on what type of quiz you're getting. And then it asks you questions that are appropriate to where Alfred is. And when you get to the end of that quiz, you get to a screen that shows you how Alfred is going. So he's going, you know, how's he going in terms of 
his note reading or his uh, rhythm or this or that. And it's all based on your assessment and all the questions are quite open so that you can interpret them in the way that you like to work. But it gives you that clear indicator of this is the area, these are the areas I need to work on with the students, the student, and these are the areas that he's doing really well in already. Helps you zoom out, get a different perspective on it and hopefully get a little bit more clarity on what you need to work on, but also alleviate some of your potential imposter syndrome and insecurities around your students' progress, right? So am I doing it right? Do they know the things they're supposed to know at this level? Well, now you have the answer. And there's no one size fits all here, but there is an indicator and hopefully it's been a useful one for you. I know loads of members have already tried it out. So if you have, let us know. And if you're excited about it, but you haven't tried it out yet, let me know about that as well. That's our biggest news that came out in the middle of last week. All right, so what's coming up? Well, next week, two exciting things on Monday, right? Exactly a week away. So first of all, on the show next week, we were going to do a show about students quitting and we're still doing that. So if you saw that coming up and you're like, no, I wanted that topic, that's fine, don't worry. That's moving out a week though, because next week we're gonna have a guest on. Does anyone know who it's gonna be? You might know. It's someone who's been on before and she's from Ireland. And she writes amazing music. June Armstrong is going to be on the show and she's going to be talking to us about this book not just playing through the pieces and talking to us about her new book which is beautiful by the way but this particular book is really interesting which is why I wanted to have June on so June is going to come on to talk about how you can use this book or really any book of pieces to take the ideas and have your students improvise and play around with the piece. So this bo book, these pieces are really built to have those improv moments. And I'm really excited to have her share how she's using it and her tips for good improvisation and of course answer any questions you guys have. Um, if you want a little taste of the book in general, by the way, I played one of the pieces, sight read, okay, it's not a beautiful performance, but I sight read through one of the pieces on Instagram. So you can look at the Colourful Keys in Instagram if you're interested in what the pieces sound like. I think they're gorgeous. I really do. And I'm really excited to have June on. So she's coming on next week. She's going to be right here at this time. But then two hours after that, we have our next masterclass. So the masterclass is about growing gritty students in a digital age. It's kind of the culmination of this big month on motivation and grit and growth mindset. And if you want to sign up for that, if you haven't already, I have the link. There it is. Vibermusicteaching.com slash grit. Vibermusicteaching.com slash grit. So that is going to be um, about an hour. It's a masterclass. It's at 6 p.m. my time, so two hours after when this was live for reference. But there's information, of course, on that page about when it is. The live and the replay for non-members will be available for 12 hours to give everyone in different time zones a chance to watch the replay. After that, it is only for members. So if you do sign up and you're not a member, you can become a member and join us on the inside and still watch the replay anytime. Or you can make sure to watch it soon after. It's really just, we just extend that replay to be fair to everyone around the world. Um, it's supposed to be a live experience, right? So after that, it'll be just for members. And then the following week, we will have our, no, not quite the following week, anyway. After that, we will have our member huddles to follow up. So that will be entirely just for members. And if you're not a member and want to check out all that's included, you can go to vibrantmusicteaching.com to find out about that. But our huddles are our private member calls to follow on from the masterclass topic and 
talk about it together so that we can really put everything into action. And we use Zoom for this and we use breakout rooms. So you go into small groups. Those who attended the Teacher Turbo Boost will be very familiar with the format. You go into small groups of four to five teachers. It's completely private, nothing's recorded. You just chat and um, dive into the topic between all of you. And then that's it. Yeah, it's a live experience. But the difference this time, we did this before in February, the last, ma the last master class. That's a lot of T sounds. The last master class, but we only did one because it was kind of a test run. And this time we're doing two. So you can look at the calendar page. Just go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash calendar if you're a member and you can see the times there in your time zone. That's why I'm not going to list them here because they'll be in your time zone there. And they're two sort of differing times, Friday and Monday, so that hopefully one of them suits you. Right? We're trying to make sure it works for everyone. <laughs> Carrie, yeah. So just to reiterate, go to the calendar page. That's the best thing to do. Go to the calendar page and then it's in your time zone. And you don't have to listen to me trying to do different time zones because it's boring and because I'm terrible at it. I'm really not very good at time zones. So you should go look there. <laughs> right. So that is next Monday, two really fun things coming up. Right, let's dive into our main topic of today, all about motivation mistakes. When it comes to motivating students, I get a lot of different questions, a lot of different emails about this from teachers and posts that I see around and about the place lamenting students, not practicing, not being motivated, not wanting to do this or that. And there are things that I see crop up again and again as answers or as potential answers that aren't the answers and pitfalls that I see teachers, especially new teachers, falling into really regularly. So I'd love to hear from you what you would guess these are. And I'm going to share my five with you right here. The first one is zap. What? What am I talking about? Zap. All of these are going to be on a food theme just for fun. And zap, when you zap something, that means you put it in the microwave. So the mistake that I call zap, you might also call quick fixes. This is when you go out looking for really easy ways to fix problems with motivation that will work instantly that are the equivalent of a ready meal. And here's the thing, they don't work. They're full of sodium and they don't actually do the nutritious job that you need them to do. So yeah, it's things like maybe sometimes coming to a video like this and hoping you're gonna get an answer. I hope I will give you some information. I hope I'll give you some inspiration, but I can't fix your students' practice problems and you can't do it in the space of a video either. It is impossible to do that. There's no quick fix when it comes to motivation. There's only slow burns and we have to be okay with that. So whether it's an app or an incentive system or a prize box or whatever else, it's always going to be a short-term fix if you try to do it quickly and zap the problem away. There is no secret. I'm sorry, I know. But if there was, do you really think it would be a secret? Do you think other teachers would keep it from you? I wouldn't. If there was a secret, I would tell you. I promise you. And there isn't one. So we can't zap these things away. Mistake number two is full meals. This sounds like the opposite already. What am I talking about? I'm contradicting myself so early on in the game. Well, what I mean by full meals is starting too big. This is a mistake I made. This is probably my biggest mistake for many years in my early teaching career. Starting too big as in trying to do everything at the same time. So when a student joins your studio, trying to get them into good practice habits with good practice strategies, with parental support, following every note in their assignment sheet, practicing, 40 minutes a day, five days a week, all of these things, all at once, right now. 
it doesn't work. We need to give them success at each stage and that means we have to break it up. So here's been my solution to that, which is to focus entirely on the habit first. That's my first concern. And that may take up to three months in the beginning stages of the student's journey with me. We just focus most of the time for about a semester, especially if they're younger, on establishing the habit. I don't care how long they practice. I don't care what they practice. I don't care how they practice. I just want them to practice five days a week, any amount of time, any stuff. <laughs> now, of course, I add to that, okay, try to follow what's on the list or gentle other instructions, but really all I want is that habit. Then we can build on that. We can, so that's say the little side of peas. Okay, so what are we gonna have next? And what are we gonna have next? And we gradually build up to that full meal, which includes lots of different practice strategies and doing the right things at the right times. And yes, practicing more and practicing every day. But it has to build up in stages. Even when you get into that next stage, we need to keep it to simple practice instructions. So what I'm trying to tell myself to do is after that habit is established, the next stage is actually just, first of all, we're going to emphasize repetitions. I just want that they understand that they need to repeat things and then they understand that they need to repeat parts of things. And then we start to build up more specific habits like a a uh, simple practice strategy like crossing the river, which is where you move three things. You have three things on the left of the piano and every time you play it correctly, you move one to the right of the piano and every time you play it incorrectly, one goes back over the river. And that's just a way to visualize three times in a row correctly, right? Which is the next stage. And then from there, maybe we do a next strategy and the next strategy, but it's one at a time so that you're always being successful right? I've heard this referred to, I think, as a success spiral, right? So you're building it up and they all build on each other. And eventually you have this great, solid practice foundation, but it takes a long time and you can't have a full meal right away. It has to be in little bitty pieces. What about desserts? This is linked to growth mindset and motivation and extrinsic motivation specifically. So what I mean by dessert is focusing on an end reward that is not necessarily linked to or part of the process. The process is the candy. The process is the reward. And we know this from our own music. If you still play, if you still practice pieces and study and work hard at things and get better, it's because you enjoy the process of working on them. Otherwise, I mean, gosh, I don't know what you're doing it for. You have to get some kind of enjoyment out of that time because that's most of the time. There's very little of the time that we actually get to perform that piece, right? The end result is, very, is a very small percentage. So we have to enjoy the process of working on it. And if we're going to do that, it's counterproductive to focus too much on the dessert that comes at the end. So whether that's, yes, a reward like actual candy and actual dessert or the performance, we can't focus too much on that. We have to bring it back to the pride we take in the process and enjoying how far we've come and all the work that we put into that along the way with students and with ourselves. Mistake number five is about not having a recipe. What do I mean by that? A recipe in this context is a plan. Too often we go into uh, work with a particular student or um, our teaching in general without a clear plan for where we're going. Now, I'm not saying we need a prescriptive, defined, exact route. I'm not saying we have to follow the same course of study with everyone. But we do need a recipe and we do need guidelines. 
And we need to know that our students know that we are following a recipe. We need to have a plan so that our students get to where they want to go. But we also need our students to know that there's a recipe behind that. And we need parents to know that. And if you've ever struggled with parents pushing you to have their child learn a particular piece, to do some particular exam, to do some particular competition, this is part of the problem. They don't think you have a recipe. Even if you do, they don't think you do. They can't see it. They can't see the progress. And they want to know that there's some kind of return on their investment. I'm not saying in terms of money or some crazy amount of progress, but they need to know that there is progress being made and they can't see what we can see. They don't have our training, even if they studied music. They don't have our training in pedagogy. They don't have the experience of working with students through the process of learning. So they can't see the progress that we can see, can they? We know how far it is to come from reading pre-staff notation to reading steps and skips on the staff. That looks like nothing to an outsider. <laughs> it, they don't even register that anything has happened. Or we see the huge amount of progress that has gone into a student being able to properly make a nice hand shape when they used to have a collapsed knuckle bridge, right? Parent can't see that. So we need to tell them somehow. Maybe you do reports. Maybe you give them student uh, sleuth progress reports that you export from our new system. Maybe you just send regular emails talking about all the things that were achieved this week. But 99 times out of 100, when a parent is pushing for a particular goal, it's because they don't think there is one or they can't see the progress. So make sure they know there's a recipe going on. And then lastly, the last mistake is not having a menu. What do I mean by that? Not having a menu. This is about student choice. Your students, especially as they go forward, especially as they get a little bit older and go forward in their studies, they need to have ownership over what they're doing and they need to have choice of what they study and what they learn. Would you be motivated to learn pieces just because someone told you to? If you hated the music? I mean, think of whatever it is that you hate. I can't think of what I hate. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sure there's some music that I hate, right? If someone was forcing me to learn it, I wouldn't practice. And if I did practice and I was somehow forced to do it by some overlord parents, I wouldn't really make much progress during that time because I wouldn't be focusing properly. Wouldn't be motivated to achieve the end result. So we need to give our students choice. They don't have to have choice over everything. I'm not saying every single piece you go to your student and say, what would you like to learn next? That goes back to not having a recipe to be honest. That's too loose for me. I think we need to have a forward trajectory. I think we need to have, most of the time, a portion that we're setting based on what we know of our student and what they would enjoy probably, and a portion that they are setting, that they get to choose. And they don't have to choose freely. Like I said, it's a menu. So you offer them a menu, i.e. a list of pieces, with links to where they can listen to it or watch someone else play it and ask them which one they want to do. Now, for me personally, I nine times out of 10 prefer a list of book links because I don't want to do this every single few weeks, right? Especially at that like late beginner, early intermediate stage, you would be going back to them again and again and, and it's not going to happen. So they're not going to get as much choice. I prefer to go to them with a list of books and say, listen to a few pieces from each one and let me know which one you're really excited to learn. And if you're not excited by any of these, come back to me and tell me. But they've never done that. But I'd like to give them that option that it's clear that they have to love it. It's not just pick which one of these is the least odious to you. It's pick which one of these you love. And we can always find one that they love. So there we have it. Five mistakes. We've got Zap trying to look for quick fixes. 
full meals, trying to jump straight into the best possible practice scenario rather than going step by step. Dessert, promising too much in terms of rewards or focusing your attention too much on the reward instead of the process along the way. Not having a recipe, so not showing students that you have a plan, that you have mapped out their progress, that you know where they're going and it's based on their goals overall. And then not having a menu, not giving students enough choice in what they learn and yeah, the pieces that they actually end up playing because we all need a little bit of more ownership over what we study. Many of us tout our ultimate goal as being creating lifelong musicians. And if you're not giving your students choice, they have no chance of being lifelong musicians because they don't practice choosing their own music and they aren't motivated to learn things because they love them, which is what keeps you playing for the rest of your life. All right. Keep your questions and your thoughts coming on motivation. I'm going to go into our web reviews next and then we're going to finish up with our Ask Me Anything section. So remember, you can type a question and ask me anything for the next few minutes and I'll make sure to get back to everything at the end. Okay, here's our first website. Before we get to our first website, sorry, let's do our web rules. What are we looking for? Okay, so these are the six things we look for in every studio website that we look at. They need to have enough text. They need to have clear calls to action, meaning a button telling us what to do and how to do it. They need to have consistency in their branding. So a couple of colors, couple of fonts, nothing more than that. They need to showcase themselves personally and they need real photos of them in their studio, if at all possible, with their real students and a simple menu structure. All right, so if you've thought about this or have questions about websites, please add them in as we look at our first website today. This is Joy in Music Piano Studio. And I think this is a really interesting one to look at because I, my guess is that Joy looked at this maybe on a different size screen. So this screen is relatively big. And we can see that it's quite hard to read this piano studio part. So that would be my first thought, Joy, is we need to change the coloring here and maybe change the way this is set up so that we can definitely see this and it looks clean and simple. I also would consider removing this background up the top here entirely and making it just one plain color, just, even just black or white. Um, doesn't have to be anything fancy because those lines I find a little bit distracting. Now, I don't see a call to action on the home page, so straight away I'm not sure where I should go next. And I'm going to end up diving into the menu, so I will get to that in a second. What I love about this home page is that we've got photos. And you can see here they're not, you know, the most amazing, high quality, professionally taken photos in the world, but they're extremely effective, aren't they? They make me think, oh, this is a real teacher who really cares about her students. Straight away, they give me that imp impression and I love it. So yeah, just a call to action would be my first thing here. A button that tells me how to book a lesson or get on a waiting list or something like that. And then the menu, I think, can be tidied up quite a lot here. So, oh, sorry, it's Joy in Music. Your name is Enjoy. Sorry, reading too quickly there. But we have about Alice. Piano lessons, piano, piano for adults, policies, testimonials, contact me. There's nothing wrong for with any of these. Although piano for adults, I would maybe put under here, as in just put it on the same page as piano lessons. I don't know that it needs its own menu item. But the main problem here is that it's going over two lines, which is quite confusing to look at. So we need to look at increasing that width or making the text a bit smaller to fit in or other ways to fit it all on one line because two lines is, is quite confusing. I also, and this is kind of personal preference, I know many people feel differently, but I don't love a separate testimonial page. I prefer testimonials to be used throughout the site. 
Okay, so here's the thing. We've got this font here. This is a good example of consistency. This is the same font, but much smaller. This has uh, two different fonts, which haven't been used on any other page. This has another font again. And so does this. You see how that simple, if you just made it all the same font, or you can have a separate one for the headers, but just two fonts and two colors. That's my goal for you, Alice. So two fonts, two, two colors throughout the whole site. See if you can tidy up this menu. See if you can add a button there and I think you'll be doing great. The text on this site is already great and the photos are great. It's just about the appearance. So hopefully you can get those things sorted really quickly and I hope that review was helpful. The next one we'll look at is this site right here. So this is Let's Play Music and I believe this is another teacher's... Oh, I thought we were on the page for just her. Yes, I think we are. So this is a, a page within the Let's Play Music site. Oh, maybe we're not. Uh, okay. No, I think we might get the a better link for this and try it next week because we need it to be just to their page. I'm not going to review Let's Play Music site because that's not, you know, they haven't volunteered for this. It was supposed to be just this teacher's page. So I think we need to re-look at that. Okay, so with that, let's get into our Ask Me Anything section and get your questions. All right. So questions, I saw a few fly in there. I'm just gonna make sure we get to all of them. Okay, so Lee. Oh, that's the one we had, the newer one. Okay, so Lee, what ideas do you do in summer lessons? Okay, so Lee, few things I'll say right up front. So I don't do many summer lessons at all. So I should put that out there. I used to do more, I do less now. I tend to use the summer to work on this business and all the things I do for teachers and I do teach a few lessons but it's just it's I don't market it very much I just say to parents hey if you want summer lessons there's two days a week open and you can book your own slot and that's it so it's just for those students who really really want to check in with me over the summer what do I do in those summer lessons in general they've come up with their own project so they're students who are really motivated to study during the summer and to practice various things. And so they tend to come to me with, I've started working on Bohemian Rhapsody or whatever, and we work on it, uh, answering their questions. If I were to do some specific projects in the summer though, and I had all my students there, I would tend towards, yeah, a really fun project. So something like, Oh, there's so many options, but let's say a composing project would be great, especially if you put together an album. If you are in a position where you want to motivate people to take during the summer, I think putting together a book of everyone's compositions at the end of the summer and like showcasing that in your studio in September might introduce a bit of FOMO for your other students so that they want to take next summer because it happens each year. So something like that can be really fun. I know uh, Clinton Pratt does a concert which is exclusively for students who take during the summer and that like happens at the end of the summer and it's this really cool, intera uh, not interactive, anyway, media-based concert and that's really cool. So I think a performance opportunity, a project where you complete something is a great thing to do during the summer. Also, many teachers just focus on stuff they don't get to during the year so whatever that is for you or your students like if your students have a heavy classical focus Jana who I think is still here mentioned she does this recently so she tends to get to like the pop stuff and the other things because her students are very focused on their classical repertoire during the year and during the summer they're a bit looser and they do other genres so that can be another great idea hopefully that helps Lee then Lori is your studio flipped? Usually your piano is on the left. It also seemed a bit darker today. Something is different and I can't put my finger on it. So the lighting is different, Laurie. I don't think it's 
flipped. This is the way I normally look at it. So, oh, from a while ago though, but this is the way it was for the whole of the Turbo Boost. Um, a few months ago, the piano was certainly on the other side. My right, as I'm looking at you, so your left, yeah. Um, it was over there. So that was flipped. A lot of things have changed though. I'm also for further away from the background, which is part of the audio issues and the echo and stuff, but it's because I'm standing the whole time now. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, the darkness, the lighting is a bit different today, as I said. That's a long story and not very interesting, so I won't go into it. <laughs> okay, I think that was all your questions. Let me just check in with the chat to make sure. Yeah. All good. Okay, awesome. I hope you all enjoyed this session today. It's been great to hang out with you all as always. Next week we will have this lady right here. That's not a picture of her, but that's her book, June Armstrong. I'm so excited to share her music with you and her ideas on improvisation. And make sure to sign up to our masterclass as well. That's happening next Monday a little bit later than this session right here. So vibrantmusicteaching.com slash grit. And if you remember, the uh, huddles will be shortly after that on Friday and Monday following. So I will see you all of those places. I hope you have a fabulous week and happy teaching. See you next time. <laughs>